רגע, היה יו אוהב תפוגט אבו דה מאץ'. אנחנו מצויים עכשיו במהלך תחרות רובינשטיין. תחרות רובינשטיין לפסנתרניה, התחרות הבינלאומית המפורסמת הגדולה של ישראל. אחד השופטים שלנו הוא אבודג'ין פרט. שלום אבודג'ין. שלום אריק. Uh, I understand that as a young boy you considered a career of a tennis player. I played a lot of tennis when I was, when I was young. Up, yeah. Professionally, almost. Well, not, I wouldn't say that, but very, very seriously. Very seriously. I find a lot of similarities between tennis playing and piano playing. Um, it's been, obviously, the very famous book, Inner Game of Tennis and Inner Game of Music, and uh, the uh, amount of concentration required is, is, is quite similar. Let's count one by one the similar elements. Oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, <laughs> I think the, 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 I mean, obviously anything uh, to do well requires the highest amount of concentration and focus and execution. Um, uh, I think probably the most similar moment is the moment of the serve, where the, where the, the, the tennis player controls the point the most, which is what the pianist does is, is has all the time the advantage of yeah later on control. you have to respond to later somebody on, else to but respond, with a but serve, in the moment that's the moment you control that's you yeah and so um i think at the piano that's you, you sort of have the serve all the time yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's so, that's yeah, cute i yeah, like yeah. it uh, serve all the time all the i'll time. remember that uh and sometimes though you know the, the piano might fight back <laughs> and so you have a little bit of uh or the hall or the acoustics a little bit um But uh, I think in the, in the practice as well, um, in, in tennis, you know, you drill a shot and you drill a passage. Uh, what you hit the shot, you see what the, the uh, <laughs> feedback, well, you know, if, if, if what you intended happened, and you re refine it the same way that happens in your practice. So. And in both cases, you are on your own. It's not a team yeah. play. Tennis you, is... Yeah, you're on your own, um, and you're in your, your own head. Um, Uh, and I think that's the that's the I think in many ways though the the sport that's closest to tennis uh, in the sense of requiring not an opponent is golf because in golf you control every action again you have the serve every time and it's in your head um, this kind of focus and talking of opponents yeah. in piano playing you have the worst opponent which is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just inside in the battle with uh, figuring out what the composer was after and, and uh, trying to get it, get it across to the audience. And, and uh, self one and self two are self fighting. Self one and self two, yes. You are you're really great. No, you're horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're really great. No, you're horrible. No, no, the worst. <laughs> yeah. Self two telling to self one, I told you. I told yeah, you. Yeah. You are no good. I also thought that the tonal production of the piano is in a way similar with, with tennis, because here the ball meets with the rocket in no time, a fraction of a second, okay? Yep. Also our hammer meets... The contact point is so yep. brief. It's no time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one is shorter? I would imagine the hammer on the string is shorter. A, can you measure it? I'm sure somebody could, <laughs> but I don't, I don't have the appropriate uh, expertise. But I imagine because of the mass of the ball um, and the racket, the, probably the, 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 the more strings and so forth. And, and they, they spend a lot of time, actually, with the strings, string makers, yeah. to try and uh, certain strings so that you can get more spin, that they actually grip yeah. the strings yeah, for longer yeah, yeah. than another. Yeah, than, <laughs> also, than, so we, 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 we can, try. We, we, we try, yeah. but uh, probably we not try with to as do much. The, yeah. But what I... try to think is that though the meeting point is no time is yeah. nano yeah. is zero point yet it summarizes what you prepare beforehand yes. and what you plan to do and what happens yes so past future and present present yeah in piano playing exactly we prepare so yeah present punk Then we hear. <laughs> Let me hear. <laughs> And we hear, <laughs> let me hear. How, it, how it went. Down And the line, or did it go cross court? Yes. And let me make it singing, not Yes, yeah, yeah. Let me make it yeah. um, to the next note. Yeah. Uh, when you follow the meeting point yeah. in tennis, what do you do normally? The follow through um, actually still has an impact uh, on, on what happens with the ball. So. Uh, if my follow-through is this way, it goes down the line. If it's this way, then it's going cross-court. Um, 
and that still comes from the preparation, but uh, um, the follow-through is, is, is kind of critical. You know, I never played tennis, unfortunately. We uh, used to play on the beach. <laughs> I, with I see every day. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, very, very primitive in great, comparison to well, that. Well, I don't know, but it it's, looks like pretty great exercise out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, exercise it is. <laughs> but that I will not compare to piano playing. No, uh, I understand no. that uh, when you came uh, and played with Haifa Symphony a yeah. couple of years ago, yeah. uh, which concerto was it? I played, I think, Beethoven 4, and I think I played Tchaikovsky. It was I two see. times here. I then think. you were playing tennis with Stanley Sperber. Yes, uh, <laughs> Stanley was the conductor, and, and he knew that I played tennis and, and invited me to play uh, one of the times, and was quite, I never played with the Davis Cup referee before. So it was yeah, quite a so uh, Stanley is a very skillful player, but yes. he's uh, one of the top referees. Yes, yes, He's indeed. a professional referee. Absolutely. And yeah. how is it as a player? He was a very good player. And he as was a, a very conductor? Good player. And a very good conductor okay. as well. Better conductor than player, for sure. <laughs> so you won. I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shame but on I you. But I was, I was, yeah, I, I was uh, playing quite well at the time still. So. Um, and talking of, about playing well, yeah. we would like to ask you to play a piece by Couperin. I'll play Couperin. This is uh, in translation from the French. It's mis mysterious barricades. Okay. Ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what a fancy name. It's a, well, Couperin had uh, many, many fancy names. That was uh, one of the big differences from him and the other the German Baroque composers. Awadajin, that was so beautiful, and while playing, I was thinking for myself, you know, we did so many intermezzo shows, uh, almost 400, and never Couperin. Would you believe it? That is hard to believe. That is hard to believe. But uh, the French Baroque are really beautiful pieces, and uh, it's a recent discover from, discovery for me as well, probably the last three and years. And you played on the piano. I don't have any choice. <laughs> I'm a pianist. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was originally written for? Clavichord, clavecin. Yeah. Clavecin, harpsichord, harpsichord yeah. cembalo. Yeah, yeah. Um, and while playing it on the piano with pedal and so on, yeah. it, you made it belong to the 21st century. Well, that's good. That's good. I think um, uh, all composers uh, with with rare exception, always uh, um, appreciated the advances on the instruments as they came along. So I think that any of the composers before would have, give or take a couple of things, they might might uh, a few nuances that uh, some of the instruments had that we don't have. But I think they would fully appreciate the modern piano. Yeah, and also to make it musica viva, not yeah. like you yeah. come in the museum in the morning <laughs> and, and, just sort and, of and clean the dust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you play often, eh, Couperin? 
the last uh, few years, probably two or three years, I just uh, discovered the pieces actually fairly late, um, fairly recently, I should say, um, and uh, put, have put them in my programs, coupled with uh, some Scarlatti. Some, I see, uh, yeah, that's yeah, cute. Yeah, so yeah. everything but not Bach. Well, currently used to be all Bach. <laughs> so, I see. so uh, yeah. Yeah. I see. And as a professor, do you introduce it to your students? I don't have any students playing Couperin. Um, they've been playing Scarlatti. We did a 1685 concert a few years ago with my students, so it was uh, Handel, uh, Handel, Bach, and Scarlatti. Um, but uh, we have we didn't do a uh, we haven't not come around to Couperin yet. Yeah, you you know Bach is so great. Yes. And around him all. Those composers became a victim. Yes, they, they ended up becoming satellites. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah, 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 they really yeah. Uh, satellite. <laughs> it's like uh, yeah. uh, to, to speak of tennis. It's it's like those that grew up either that played either with Sampras or with uh, with Federer <laughs> um, until now Nadal, of course. But uh, a lot of people would have been stars, uh, but they became satellites. And in the case of French uh, Baroque, we have not only Couperin. Maybe Couperin was the greatest, but... Rameau. Rameau. Yeah. Dacan. Yeah. Now, you are a judge at the Rubinstein competition, yes. and nobody played Couperin. Nobody played French. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in uh, the competition that I am the artistic director of in Cincinnati, we have a Baroque uh, requirement with many composers listed, in Coup including Couperin, and everyone plays... Almost everyone plays only Bach or Scarlatti, um, so I don't, I'm not sure why they're so neglected. So maybe I should play more, <laughs> more and more Cooper. And that is such an important uh, fact that today young pianists are tuning themselves too much for competition. So if you require this repertoire on a competition, that will become their repertoire. That's if exactly not, correct. they don't play it. Never play it. And and you can tell even. <clears throat> Even here with the applications, with uh, so many people would play a prelude and fugue. We had one French overture, one long, one big piece. Everybody else was playing like the one prelude and fugue because it was required. We didn't require it here with Rubinstein, but it was required for other some other competitions. <laughs> I just have one token piece, one from category A, one from category B, and so forth. Talking of stylistic approach, if somebody plays Bach, yeah, and he plays it very freely, as you play Couperin, yeah. As a jury member, what would you say? Well, I think it's I think playing it uh, freely is the thing which uh, which makes it authentic because on those older instruments they didn't have the dynamic range that we have on the piano to to make um, to show phrases and so forth. And so they showed phrases and direction with time. And uh, so the great um, uh, uh, harpsichord and so forth players, they manipulate time. So I, I, um, I don't believe at all that it must be uh, strict in time. Short time ago, we had a distinguished guest on your bench yeah. here, Andras Schiff, uh -huh. and he said that he uses no pedal while yeah. playing Bach. Yeah, I used to uh, use no pedal playing Bach. Uh, back when my career started, I played chromatic, chromatic fantasy and fugue, several preludes and fugues, and never used pedal. And um, over time, depending on some concert halls, and, and um, it seemed like it was not, um, was not necessary to, to have such an extreme position because, there, because it took away some color opportunities. And, and um, so I, I use pedal sparingly, but, uh, but, but I, I use it. Would um, you say that Cooper and Scalati would welcome kind of free modern approach rather more than Bach? Uh, hard question. No, it's a hard question. I mean, Bach uh, was was so uh, revolutionary and so dynamic and so um, uh, broad in his uh, uh, musical thinking that, uh, and such uh, an incredible uh, improviser that I, yeah. I, I can't imagine that he would have any objections. Um, and really, Scarlatti and Kubrin as well. I mean, had various. Uh, kinds of stylistic developments and changes and innovations that I think they would all uh, appreciate. Freedom. Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah. yeah and I think freedom. most composers, you know, uh, we had the, the required pieces for the competition, and I think uh, the composers themselves said they appreciated finding out 
uh, what was in their music that they almost weren't aware yeah. of themselves. Yeah. And so I think that uh, composers, uh, you know, generally uh, are, are open to this. And speaking of composers, yes. who is your next composer? The next composer, I thought I would play um, something a little different here because you have had so many uh, distinguished guests playing music that everybody, most people probably know more. This is an American composer named Fred Hirsch, who is actually one of the great, greatest living jazz pianists of our, of our time. Uh, he's the only, there's a very famous venue in New York called the Village Vanguard, and he's the only person, only pianist to have had a solo week at the Village Vanguard in its history, and that's how highly regarded he is. But he had his early training was in classical music, and about, um, uh, I don't know how many years ago now, but maybe 15 years ago, he started returning to his classical roots and, and composing. And uh, his pieces have been played by, for instance, Christopher O'Reilly, who has the great show oh, from see. the top. I think Jeffrey Kahane has played his, um, he wrote, the first piece that he wrote was Variations on a Bach Chorale theme. Very big, big piece, obviously. Um, so he wrote these pieces. This is a, from a set of three pieces. It's a nocturne for the left hand alone, uh, in homage to his Russian teacher uh, with, with uh, thoughts of the Skrabin nocturne for the left hand alone. Avadajin, that was so beautiful. I must share with you my emotions. I started to listen and I shut my eyes. And you know what I thought? Mm. I thought you played uh, two pianos with eight ends. <laughs> <laughs> and I no. also thought, you know, Ravel, when he writes yeah. Mamer Lua for four hands, yeah. it's very modest. Yeah. When he writes Concerto pour la main gauche, <laughs> yeah. it sounds like uh, uh, all orchestra all in the left hand. Yeah. How is it possible? Um, well, the composers uh, are, you know, very adept at, um, at, I think it's using a lot of the bass overtones to help uh, um, carry the tune, you know, and um, they have in mind, obviously, that everyone hears, thinks left-hand piece and yeah. it should, that, it, that uh, they might expect less, and so they make it more. Yeah, and so. the melody is always with a thumb, yeah, which, is, which is easy. Yes, which is good. If it is yeah. right hand by itself, yeah, it right hand be... alone is a little bit trickier. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. have to. Yes. <laughs> um, we would like now to move to the White House. Oh, let's go. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to move there too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
very happy there. Uh, it was, you know, an incredible occasion. Uh, actually, this was the third time I was at the White House, so um, it felt a little bit, a little bit more like my house. But it was, third a, it was the third time. Yeah, I Who played, was the first president? I played twice for President Clinton. Yeah. What so. did you play for him? Man, the first time was uh, was kind of uh, was in the East Room as well, and uh, I played a 30-minute recital both times, and I can't remember everything. I know I had some Rachmaninoff preludes, and the interesting thing about that was that he said that he'd had a friend when he was at, I can't remember if he was at Oxford or Cambridge, whichever august institution he was in, uh, that uh, he had a friend who used to practice the piano, and he I knew see. those Rachmaninoff preludes. Um, the second time was the uh, state dinner for Thabo Mbeki, who was the president of South Africa at the time. Um, so this was the this was classical music day at the White House. It was actually a really exhausting day. We had uh, several different events during the course of the day, and then a piano trio with Josh Bell and Alyssa Weilerstein and um, Mendelssohn piano trio, and there was an event for kids like 40. Sorry, 160 kids from around the country that Michelle Obama had hosted in the afternoon as well. I so. think you must be nominated as pianist in residence. <laughs> that would be a nice thing. At the White House. Yeah, that would be a nice thing. Yeah, yeah just yeah, sit yeah, there yeah, all just, day. <laughs> just, uh, <well. laughs> like Scalati was for the Queen of Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a bad it's position. It's not a bad position. Yeah. <laughs> what would you like to play for us now? I think I'll close with a, a little piece. Um, also by Fred Hirsch, he played in, uh, in Cincinnati and, and had played this as an encore and I uh, had thought to myself, I hope that he maybe wrote this one out as well and, and he did. It's called Valentine. Valentine? Valentine, Valentine. Yes. okay. It's my wife's favorite piece. Yeah, so. yeah, Valentine. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to thank you for being with us and especially for the last piece which sounded for me like a love song from an American musical. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's I think 
probably what he was going after, and um, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful little um, gem. So it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.